What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. We are those who have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death, in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. For if we have been united with him in a death like this, we will certainly also be united with him in resurrection like his. For we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin, because anyone who has died has been set free from sin. Now if we died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. The death he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its evil desires. Do not offer any part of yourself to sin as an instrument of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and offer every part of yourself to him as an instrument of righteousness. For sin shall no longer be your master, but you are not under the law, but under grace. Uh, hi everyone, my name's Simon. We're going to step through that passage together. Uh, we're, we're jumping back into Romans. Uh, if it feels like we've just landed halfway through a book, you're right. We've, um, we're six chapters into Romans, but we haven't been in the book of Romans as a church since uh, summer this year, earlier this year. So we're launching back into Romans as of today. And what an odd way to begin a section. Uh, have a look at verse 1. It says there, what shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? What an odd question to ask um, Christians. As Paul writes his letter to the Romans, he says, well, should we just go on sinning? Now, don't, I, I think that's a really bizarre question, really bizarre question to ask. Now, um, one reason why this may appear like a bizarre question, or I'm going to convince you that it's a bizarre question, is that many people in the world would classify Christians or define Christians as do-gooders. It's actually, by definition, what you do. Don't you give to charity? Don't you love your neighbour? Don't you turn the other cheek? Isn't that what you do? You're a do-gooder. Uh, I wonder if you've, as a, as a Christian, you've been at work and maybe you've slipped up somewhere, you've said the wrong thing, you've done the wrong thing, you've disappointed someone, and they've turned back and said, you're, a, you're supposed to be a Christian, aren't you? Uh, this is who you are. So many people in the world think that's actually the very definition of a Christian, that we're do-gooders. But that's not true at all. And um, as we're landing in Romans chapter 6, it's a good opportunity for me just to remind you what Paul has gone at length to teach us in Romans 1, 2, 3, and 4, and 5. Um, he has gone out of his way to use a lot of language to say a very simple thing, and that is that we're all sinners. All of us are sinners. In fact, if I just turn as a, as a, a, a reference point in Romans chapter 3, verse 23, it says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And I, um, I've come of age where I need to wear glasses to read my own Bible. It makes me wise. I'm much wiser than I used to be. As, but chapter 6, verse 23 says, for, the, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That's Paul's statement. Um, the word all there, it isn't, doesn't mean something different in the Bible than what it does in normal language. It means everyone. Everyone has sinned. Everyone's a sinner baby. That's no lie. And uh, so we're, that's the truth. We are all sinners. We're all fallen short of the glory of God. It means that to God's standards, we fall short of it. We are not up to the standards that God would expect from humanity. But it says in verse 24, Romans 3, 24, and all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. And when it says they're all are saved, it doesn't mean that everybody is saved. It means that everybody who would like, who wishes to be saved has only one way for that salvation. Everyone's 
Uh, everyone, everyone has to go through the one door for salvation, and that door is the Lord Jesus Christ, that God sent that, that one saviour through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. That is, that is the truth. So truth one is that all of us are sinners, and truth two is that if we want to be saved from our sin, from our broken relationship with God, if we want that fixed, we don't do it by being do-gooders. We do it by, by coming to the Lord Jesus Christ, who paid the price, who was the Redeemer, uh, our Saviour. One last verse in Romans, 6, uh, Romans 3, verse 25, it says, God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. So when we are guilty before God because we're sinners, God presented Christ to pay the price that we deserve for our sin. And the Bible uses a word for that. It's there in Romans 3. The word is grace. It is by grace that we've been saved. It's a gift. It's not something we work our way up to. It's something that God says, come and receive it. Come today. Don't hold it off. Don't delay. Today's the day of salvation. There's nothing more important in this world than to come to Jesus so that you will put an end to your sin, uh, paid for at the cross, and come to, to come to Jesus. So that's by, by grace. In fact, friends, what Romans 1, 2, 3, and 4 has taught us is that we are not do-gooders. Um, our world will have us convinced that, that humans are basically good, but we do make mistakes sometimes. But the Bible says, no, I want you to flip that understanding. We are basically bad. At, the heart, at our heart, we are rebels towards our maker. And that makes us, at the core, very bad. So we are, we're, we're sinners, but it's by grace that we've been saved. Um, we need grace. That's what Romans 1, 2, 3, 4 has taught us. We need grace. And without God's mercy, his compassion, his, his atoning work at the cross, then we are... Um, to quote Jason Moss, we are stuffed. Um, uh, we need grace. But then you might say, okay, so we're not do-gooders, we're sinners who need grace. Well, then what's the point of the law? It, it, the Ten Commandments are in the Bible. Isn't that given from God? And what's the point of all those little parts in the Bible that say you need to do good? What, what's the point of that if, we're not, if Christians are not do-gooders? Well, Paul says, uh, answers that in Romans 5, verse 20. So just before we get to our, chapter, our passage for today, we get Romans 5, verse 20, where Paul says, The law was brought in so that the trespass might increase. Um, so brought in means it wasn't always there. Uh, God at some point said, Oh, here's some, here's some rules that we can, we can live by. And he gave us the Ten Commandments, for example. But... Paul says there that when the law was brought in, it didn't actually reduce sin, it increased it. Now, how does that work? I think it's a bit like a crime scene investigation location. You know, uh, I've never been to a crime scene, but I watch them all the time on telly. And uh, they, they come in and, uh, and there's a motel room, you know, because everything happens in motel rooms. And it looks pretty decent. The, whole, the room looks okay. It's been, it's been uh, well kept by the... Um, the, the people who keep the motel, where they walk in and the place looks okay. But then the police, they turn off the lights and they bring in their forensic, their blue, bright blue forensic light, and then the whole wall just glows like a Christmas tree. There's, there's evidence of crime everywhere, blood stains and who knows what on the, on the walls and everywhere. What looked clean, the forensic light has come in, shone a light on it and said, bam, this is a wicked place, something evil has happened here. The law is just like that. We are born sinners, just like Adam turned his back on God. We, we live our lives with, a, with our backs turned to God. When God introduced the law, it was as if he was proving to us that we can't do it. We just can't do it. And so if sin highlights, if, if the law highlights our sin, Romans 5, 20 says the law was brought in so that the trespass might increase, but where sin increased, grace increased all the more. And so here's where Paul has landed us at the end of chapter 5, Romans 6, chapter 5. Sorry, what am I head doing? Romans 5, where, where Paul has landed to us at the end of chapter 5, is that we're all sinners, but God's grace is big enough 
for all of us. And if, if this grace, this unlimited grace, can cover all sin, and if it doesn't matter how much we pile up our sin, God's grace can cover all that. When God's grace covers all that, God looks so much more merciful and kind and gracious and loving and compassionate. If that's the mathematics of it, then maybe we could just keep on sinning. So there's the question that Paul asks at the beginning of chapter 6. Should we just go on sinning? Because if we keep sinning, God looks even more gracious. Look how great he looks by us not changing our lives. We could just keep on being the person that we, we've experienced all of our life. We heard a testimony up here this morning of a, of a changed life, going to Christian schools, but not until university, having a realisation that there's something that needs to be changed. What is it, um, if, if we, what is it that needs to, needs to change in our life? Now, here's the question, right? Uh, so, so that testimony was about uh, realising that just being me for the rest of my life is not good enough. I, I'm confronted with, with God and I need to do something with my sin. So the question here to, this morning is what do Christians do with their sin? What do Christians and, and sin have to do with each other? What's the relationship between a Christian and sin? Well, Paul says, well, he answers this question quite quickly, doesn't he? He says, shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? And his answer is, no. Nah. No way. Uh, verse 2 says, by no means. It's a radical, definite no. Don't misunderstand me. He gets that out of the way. Let me not, let, let's not beat around the bush. Let's cut straight to it. And I want to say no. We shouldn't go on sinning. But he wants to expand on that. So we know his answer is no. But let's expand on what, he, what, what does he want us to learn. The first thing is, Paul says, we have died to sin. We have died to sin. Verse 2 says, by no means. We are those who have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Now, I want to say that on the surface, that sounds like a really simple argument and we could close it right there. If we have decided that sin is a terrible, terrible thing and we turn to Christ for forgiveness, then the logic is, why would we go back to sin? That makes sense, doesn't it? As if sin is dead to us. We want nothing to do with it. It is filthy. It's disgusting. How would I live my life anymore thinking about sin? But have another look at the sentence because it doesn't actually say that. It doesn't say that sin is dead to us. It says that we are dead to sin. Now, does that make a difference? I think it does. I think it does because we're not told that sin has been removed from our sight. We're not told that sin has been removed from our planet. We're not told that sin has been killed at the cross, that Jesus died on the cross and now there's no more sin in the world. We're not told that sin has become untouchable to us. Rather, we are, have died to sin. It's from sin's perspective, we are dead. We are untouchable by sin. The cross has actually set us free from the results of sin. Later on in, uh, in this same chapter, but we're going to see this verse next week, we're going to hear this phrase, that the, death, that, uh, the wages of sin is death. The wages of sin is death. You know, if you work a day's wage, you go to work, and you spend eight hours working, then at the end of the day, back in the, back in the old days, they'd give you a paycheck, and, uh, and that was your wage, your payment for the, the work you did that day. The Bible is saying at the end of your life, for the sins you've committed, there's a wage that you are given, and that is death. That is your salary. That's what you deserve. That's what you've earned for sin. But the, if the wages of sin is death, then perhaps once, once death has been given, then the wages have been paid for. Let me try to explain that a bit easier. Think of a, um, a, a, a man or a woman, a person who has uh, committed a crime. They've stolen a loaf of bread, and they've been brought before the judge, and the judge says, did you steal the bread? They say, yes, I stole the bread. And the judge says, okay, well, you're guilty. And your sentence is 30 days in prison. 30 days in prison. So they march you off to the prison cell. They put you in there. They, lock, they, they close the bar door. They lock the key and you're there. Ironically, they'll feed you bread for, the rest, for those 30 days. But you, you, you're stuck in the cell. And you wait day and night, day and night, day and night for 30 days. And you do... You're pleasant to the guards, you're on, 
you, you behave yourself well. What happens after those 30 days? The guards come in, they open up the door, they, op they, they open the door they, and you're allowed to go free. You're free. Why are you free? Is it because, you, because they've changed their mind? No, they've stuck to the bargain. You committed a crime, 30 days was the penalty. You've lived out your 30 days, the crime has been paid for, now you're free. When the Bible says that you, that you are dead to sin, it is saying that you are no longer guilty of this. The, the, the sin that, that has been weighed on you, that you've been trying to deal with your whole life and to try, try and be a better person, a do-gooder, it's been paid for already. Look at verse 7. Because, Paul says, because anyone who has died has been set free from sin. So Paul's, in, Paul's trying to convince us that when we're actually not alive, we're dead. <laughs> we're sitting here right dead this morning. But does that mean, now if you've got your thinking caps on, you might think, okay, you're saying that maybe the death that we died is the payment for our sin. Are you saying, Simon, that we pay for our own sins? Isn't that the opposite of grace? Isn't that works? And I say, thank you for asking that question. That's the best question. You're so very smart. Um, but it's not because we've paid the price. It's because Christ has paid the price and we have died to sin, point two, when we were buried with him. When we were buried with him. Have a look at verse three. Don't you know that all of us who were baptised into Christ Jesus were baptised into his death? Now, what a remarkable event we've had today. We've had a baptism. Beautiful service. It's a great thing to, to celebrate. And it's just um, a coincidence that we have a sermon here on baptism at a, at a baptism service. There's, there hasn't been um, orchestrated um, unless we can blame God for that, which we should. Uh, don't you know that all of us who were baptised into Christ Jesus were baptised into his death? Um, baptism is a response to the gospel. Imagine back in the first century when, uh, when Paul was uh, still alive and Peter and John and the other disciples. Jesus said to them, go, and, go, go out and baptise in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Go and make disciples, he said, baptising them. And so in the first century, as the gospel was preached and people heard the gospel that we're sinners, we need forgiveness, Jesus died on the cross for your sins, come to him for forgiveness. When people heard that, they responded, got on their knees and repented and as a response, were baptised um, through in, in a puddle of water or a river or it doesn't matter, the, 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 the mechanics of it are, are not important. But it's a response to their hearing of the gospel and response to the gospel. Uh, we can respond to the gospel today. So as a grown-up, an adult, hears the gospel for the first time or they, or they finally become aware that the gospel is truth and they turn to Christ for life, we can baptise an adult. In our churches, in, the, in this Anglican church, we, we love to baptise children, not because they, can, they have given their life to Christ, but their parents are speaking on their behalf. And they stand up and the parents say, I turn to Christ, I turn to Christ. And we want to raise our child to believe this and to love this. And so baptism is a response to the gospel. But here's the, here's the kick. This response to the gospel, this baptism, is more like a funeral than a bath, than bath time. You know, it does look like a bath, doesn't it? You, it, it this morning we, we sprinkled with water. So other, other occasions we may submerge or, or, or throw a bucket over someone's head to symbolise this water. Water is a wonderful um, a symbol of the washing of sin. There, there is a symbol that's used elsewhere in the scriptures, but here in Romans 6, the symbol isn't washing. The symbol is burial. It's death. Who, who is dying? It's our old self that dies, um, symbolically entering that water and coming up a new person. Have a look at the, the language that's used here. We've already said that we've that in verse 3, uh, those who were baptised into Christ Jesus were baptised into his death. Verse 4, we were therefore buried with him through baptism into, into death. Verse 5, for if we have been united with him in a death like his. And in verse 6, for we know that our old self was crucified with him. 
This is a, this is a, a death sentence. This is an act of, of death and burial, is, is what baptism in chapter 6 is pointing to. But it's Jesus, it, when Jesus paid the price on the cross, friends, it's as if we died with him. It's as if we died with him. You see in verse 5, it talks about a, being united with him in his death. There's a unity we, we, we celebrate as we bond our lives to Jesus Christ. I picture it like this. Some, this is not, I've, I've heard this illustration elsewhere. It's like trying to get from um, Sydney to London, and how would you go these days? You'd go by plane, wouldn't you? So you head off to Mascot, you board the aeroplane, you sit in your seat, you get buckled in, the door gets closed, and you're ready to travel by plane. At the front of the plane, there's a pilot who drives that plane, flies that plane. And you know, that pilot is gonna set the plane in the air and land it somewhere. Wherever that pilot chooses to take that plane, that's where you go. You are united with the destiny of that pilot. It's, it's the same thing with us and Christ. When we hear the gospel and we, by faith, turn to Christ, we, we become Christian, we belong to Jesus, and it's as if we're on this plane and Jesus is the pilot. And wherever he takes us, that's where we go. And Paul says that when Jesus died on the cross, it's as if we died. And when Jesus was buried in the tomb, it's as if we were buried with him. And for three days, we were there. And as Jesus rose to life again, it's as if we rise with him. Our destiny is his destiny, or his destiny is our destiny. But friends, does that mean that we are now dead? Well, no. It means we're now alive with God. Here's the third point. Verse 8 says, Now if we died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. If we died with him, because we are, we are united with him, his death is our death, his burial is our burial, then guess what? His resurrection is our resurrection. If we died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. Look at verse 9 and 10. For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. Victory was, was made at the cross. Verse 10, the death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. Now that's the description of Jesus. The, the death he died, he died once. No more. That one death he, he paid, the price he paid is enough for all of us. That's the great grace that we talked about earlier in the service. But the life that he lives, present tense, he lives to God, present tense. And so, friends, you and I are alive today because of Jesus, and we have a right relationship with God. We're free. We're free from the guilt and the history of our sin. It's, it's behind us. It has no power over us anymore. And so it's time for us to have a reality check. And this is what Paul says in verse 11. He says, In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. You, know, you get up in the morning, you look at yourself in the mirror and you have a reality check. Who is this person that I've got to go out and show the world today and how are they going to present themselves? Well, we get up in the morning, we need to count ourselves, consider ourselves, regard ourselves, think on it, meditate on this, that we are dead to sin. Sin is no longer our friend, but we are alive to God in Christ Jesus. And Paul goes on to be quite practical in verse 12 and 13 he says therefore don't let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its evil desires don't offer any part of yourself to sin as an instrument of wickedness but rather offer yourselves to god as those who have been brought from death to life and offer every part of yourself to him as an instrument of righteousness now someone has said that that verse 13 is quite uh, thematically and mathematically in the middle of the book of Romans uh, that this is the turning this is this is the thing that that Paul would want us to leave uh, with that rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and offer every part of yourself to him as an instrument of righteousness now why would Paul say something like that if unless it's possible for us to keep on offering bits and pieces of ourselves to sin. It's true, isn't it, that that's, that's quite possible. And we, and we could all testify to it today 
I'm sure if we got everyone up here, everyone would be able to testify as to how sin knocked at their door this week and they either said no through the power of God and his spirit or once again you said yes and you're ashamed of it and you're very embarrassed and you'd hate to come up here and confess to your brothers and sisters in Christ of what it is that you've said yes to this week. But friends, Paul speaks to you and I who have been set free from sin. It no longer has mastery over us. And he speaks to us and says, don't let sin reign in your life any longer. Think of it like a, um, a marriage service. A man and a woman come down to the front of the church and they make promises to each other. Do you? Yes. Do you? Yes. And then they've, they've committed a, each other for life. Uh, they, what they're doing, they're saying, you are my partner for life, you are my partner for life, we are committed, we are no longer two but one, and that also means, it also means we, we forsake all others. Everybody else is not invited into this marriage union. In other words, everybody else looks at that marriage union and says, uh, that is a no-go zone. That marriage union is for them and them alone. Just like we can say we're dead to sin, uh, the world can say if you're married that you're dead to the world. Uh, but you put a ring on your finger as a symbol of that commitment. Just like baptism is a, is a symbol of that commitment that we make to Christ, the wedding ring is a symbol. Now here's, here's the point of this illustration. Is it possible for that man or that woman to commit adultery? Of course it is. That, that ring doesn't, isn't a magical power, but it is a, is a symbol of the commitment that we made. And just like, that, Paul, just like that illustration, Paul speaks to us and says, you have bonded yourself to Christ, no longer have anything to do with sin. But I say this to you because sin keeps knocking at your door and it wants to rule over you and have you. But don't let it be a master. It's powerless now. Uh, the cross of Christ has, has sucked all the power out of it so don't let any of your life be given to sin. As I was a young Christian, I remember being told this illustration, that when you become a Christian, you, you open the door of your house, you, the door of your life to Jesus, and you say, I want you to come in. And Jesus says, I've been waiting for you to say that. And he bursts, he comes running into your life and says, I'm here. And, and we're here together. This is us. We're, we're done for, for life. And Jesus says, I'm so glad that I'm here with you. And you say, I'm so glad that you're here with me. And then Jesus says, what's behind that door? In your life and you say oh jesus don't worry about that that's a, that's just a that's another thing that's just my closet i don't want you to go in there and jesus says no i'm going in there i want that one as well and what's that door and you go oh, hang on a second there's a lot of doors in this place uh, you're going to go through all of them and jesus says yeah absolutely i don't want you to give any part of your life over to sin i want you to consider it as weak and futile and stupid i, I want you to think now that sin is a hopeless limp master it's powerless. So friends, when it comes to money, be generous with it, not greedy. When it comes to relationships, be gracious and kind and loving and other person-centered, not selfish and overly needy. And when it comes to your body, the temple of the Holy Spirit, be pure with it and radiant and not not seedy. Don't be greedy, needy, or seedy, but be generous, gracious, and pure. Friends, I think that knowledge is the key. If knowledge was not important, then, then the Bible wouldn't be written so that we could read it and understand it, and Paul is writing for us to understand today. Is, does sin still tempt us as Christians? Absolutely. Does sin win in the end? Not at all. Grace wins. Do you want to fight and give energy and power to the one who loves you and has died for you and set you free from sin? Or do you want to dance, continue to dance a little bit with sin in your life? The answer is obvious, isn't it? It's a resounding no, by no means. Let's feed, let's feed the spirit who wants us to, to thrive and let's, say, let's help the spirit uh, teach us to say no to sin and ungodliness. So we've learnt that sin is a terrible master, that God has sent us free, 
And why would we, having served 30 days in that prison cell to pay for the, the crime, why would we, now being free people, why would we want to go back into that prison cell and sit in it any longer? Let's live as freed people. And don't, uh, don't champion, with, as this world ch uh, chants, you be you. Um, no, I want to say no to the old me. Let's have a new chant and let's say you be the new you, the one that Christ died for, the one that Christ has redeemed and set free. And let's live by the grace of God and the power of his spirit and the knowledge of his word to fight temptation every day. Let's give thanks and praise for God. Almighty God and Heavenly Father, thank you for this lesson. It's tricky, Lord, for us to under untangle what Paul means here uh, with regard to baptism and with regard to new life, with regard to being dead to sin. But, Lord, one thing we can acknowledge, and that is that this world is, is difficult to live in. When it, pulls, when it tries to pull us away from being dedicated to you, but, Father, please give us strength to say no to sin and to say yes to graciousness, to your, to your um, gospel and to a new life, bringing glory and honour to you every day of our life. We thank you for forgiveness of sins. We thank you for the opportunity for new life. We pray, Lord, that from today onwards we would live it and enjoy it. Amen.